Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you here to AEI for a screening of The Divided Brain, a documentary based on the work of our guest of honor, uh, Dr. Ian McGilchrist. My name is Brent Orell, and I'm a fellow in residence here at AEI where I lead research on workforce development and prisoner reentry and have the chance to read a lot of interesting books. So that's great. Um, I'd like to start out with just a question, like what are think tanks for? What are they for? And I have a personal definition I wanted to share with you, which is that think tanks are really about how we gather together a bunch of intelligent, learned people and have them worry. Uh, they worry about big things, they worry about little things, but they get together and they worry. And this really capitalizes on our genetically selected predisposition to look for problems. We look for them. That's part of what it means to be human. And sometimes I wonder whether our ancestors, um, as they were on the savanna, had think tanks um, looking at the question of lion risk. Um, sometimes we ask other professional warriors uh, from the outside to come and worry with us. And that's really what we're doing tonight. Um, for me, one of the big worries um, that, I, that I think about a lot um, is that we have this paradox in American society and really across the West um, where we're bitterly divided uh, on key issues. But the way that we think about those issues and the way that we engage with one another over those issues are almost exactly the same. We're like the generals of the Civil War, the American Civil War. Two sides, but everybody was trained at West Point. And so you have uh, scorched earth and, um, and stalemate. And I, I think that that characterizes a lot of the nature of our discourse these days. And if you doubt me, then just go ahead and check your Twitter feed. Um, to, uh, and to coin a phrase, I'm old enough to remember when it wasn't like this. Um, empathy, compromise, and cooperation have receded to be replaced by rancor, division, and confirmation bias. In workforce development, that's my field, this reductionism of all things, of all data, um, expresses itself as a myopic focus on technical skills. Narrow, well-defined, uh, I know how to create a widget kind of skills. Even though employers tell us, and survey after survey after survey, um, that what they really want are good people. Uh, people who are able to work in teams, able to cooperate, able to collaborate. So I first encountered Dr. McGilchrist's work on um, Russ Roberts' podcast. Russ is with us tonight, um, uh, Econ Talk. Uh, and I'll never forget what he said at the beginning of the podcast, which is, this is a book that I cannot recommend, nor can I recommend it highly enough. And that's exactly the way I feel about this book. It is so rich and so, um, uh, just an amazing compilation of uh, both science and historical analysis. Um, I, I had what my wife calls a book emergency. I had to go out and buy a copy immediately and start reading it. So, um, but his themes really resonated deeply with my concerns and they really helped put a frame around them that I found to be very helpful. Uh, Dr. McGilchrist is a psychiatrist uh, and an expert in literature and art and trained in brain imaging at Johns Hopkins University. He is a quantum fellow uh, of All Souls College at Oxford, a fellow of Green Templeton College at Oxford, a fellow of the Royal College of Psychiatrists, a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts. You get the idea, he's quite a fellow. Um, I will not embarrass myself by trying to introduce our other featured speaker tonight, uh, John Cleese, one of the world's best known comedic geniuses, but I will thank him for his contribution to this documentary, 
and the extra effort that he's made in being with us tonight. Um, he'll be joining uh, Dr. Charles Murray from AEI and Ian for a short conversation after the film. I hope you'll stick around um, for that. So, Ian, come up and tell us what we're about to see. Well, uh, first of all, <laughs> yes, uh, I have this very tall friend, and I, I, I just look up to him so much, uh, and <laughs> that's why he's here. Now, I uh, thank you very much, all of you, for inviting me here, particularly to Brent for organizing and thinking of this, um, and uh, I just want to give you a little bit of a background. Um, this is a film, uh, uh, about 10 or 11 people have said to me, having read the book, we'd love to make film out of it. And one of them actually succeeded. That's Vanessa Dillon, who's not able to be here tonight. She's a very brave woman, um, a, a Canadian um, a, a director uh, and producer. And um, she set out to make a film, uh, which is which was narrowed down eventually to 78 minutes, and what you're about to see is being squeezed down even more to 57 minutes. And it's based on a book that took me 20 years to write and is 600 pages long and based on 2,500 um, pieces of uh, independent research. So um, what you won't get is um, much of the, the scientific basis. For that, you'll have to go to the book. But the aim is to convey the overall message of... Uh, th this book that uh, I, I wrote drawing on both my background in the humanities, in philosophy and literature, and on my training in, in medicine, neurology and psychiatry. It concerns the vexed question of the divided brain, a topic that has become toxic um, because uh, it's considered pop psychology. However, in brief, um, there is no question that the two halves of the brain are asymmetrical in everything that you can measure both structurally and functionally, and that as far as you can go back in the history of um, evolution, the, you will find asymmetrical nervous systems. The very most primitive neural network that we know of is in a 700 million year old creature called Nematostella vectensis, and its neural network is already asymmetrical. Why? That was the question that kept me busy for about 20 years. And to cut a long story short, there is an evolutionary reason why these two hemispheres have evolved with different kind of purposes, different needs, different aims, if you like to put it that way. Um, essentially, one of them serves the predator and the manipulator, the one that focuses on a detail in order to get it and use it, and the other serves the member of a species, of a, of, a, of a flock, of a kind, and is on the lookout for others, for, uh, in, including those of one's own species, but importantly also for predators. So the right hemisphere sees um, a lot more... Sorry, I, but... No, no, that's fine. Um, the, the right hemisphere of the brain sees with a, a tension that brings the whole picture into being. The left hemisphere sees with a narrow focused attention to little tiny bits. Now that may sound um, uh, okay, interesting fact, but actually it has massive implications because how you attend to things depends, uh, sorry, on how you uh, attend to things depends what it is you find. Things change with different kinds of attention. And my thesis in the first part of the book is to explain the philosophical import of this, as well as the mass of scientific data that validates my thesis. The second part of the book is a review of Western civilization, from the Greeks through the Romans to the Renaissance to the Reformation, the Enlightenment, Romanticism, Modernism, and Postmodernism. Just a small task. And what I'm looking at there, and the only reason that it's not a complete work of hubris to do that, is that I'm using a special lens. How balanced was that society in its take on the world between the vision of the right hemisphere and the vision of the left? Because we need both, but they need to be integrated. And my thesis is that in our civilization, as we stand now, we have lost that integration, and we're focusing only on what the left hemisphere tells us to the detriment of the rest. 
what the right hemisphere could tell us is about things that are implicit, that are in the background, that are unique, that are connected, that are flowing and changing, whereas the left hemisphere talks to us about details that are fixed and separate and manipulable. And that makes a whole difference to how you view what a human being is, what the world is, and how the two relate. So that is, in a way, the thesis of uh, the book. And the film does its best to cover this enormous range. And I hope you will consider that it might be of interest because it's aimed at people who are not specialists in any of these areas. It's designed to uh, put across a relatively simple message if you want to know the more sophisticated detail and the nuances of, of, of the story, then you would have to read the book. But I think the film is not a bad place to start. And those of you who have not seen, by the way, there's a little cartoon on YouTube, an RSA cartoon that's only 10 minutes long. It's also an extremely good place to start if you want to understand what I'm on about. So without more ado, let's see the film. And afterwards, I'm going to engage in a bit of a discussion, I hope, with uh, Charles Murray. Thank you. going to have some conversation up here. Um, I've asked um, Charles Murray, who uh, is a longtime part of AEI and, and probably among those um, who know as much or more about cognition than anybody else here, uh, and uh, asked him, I gave him the book ahead of time, also gave him the video ahead of time so he could consider it. I've asked him to respond um, for a few minutes um, with kind of top of mind um, impressions. And then uh, he's going to ask our guests some questions. So, Charles. Well, I've been doing panels at AEI for 23 years. And never have I looked out of a room and realized how completely unessential I was to the panel, as I, as I am today with John Cleese and, and uh, Ian McGilchrist uh, sitting next to me. But I will be brief, since I know you all want me to cede my time to uh, John. I, w I want to. My wife wants me to cede my time to John. I think that what Ian has done, first, I think it's brilliant. And I say that not aligning myself with his theory about left brain, right brain, because I'm not competent to make a, a judgment about that. But I think it's a brilliant addition, and in fact, one of the early examples of something that has been happening uh, in the social sciences that I think is very healthy. And that consists of a growing sense of moderation in our enthusiasm for the Enlightenment, uh, which is not to say that I have uh, rejected the Enlightenment. I am really happy about the Industrial Revolution that has taken a couple of billion people out of extreme poverty over the last 20 or 30 years. I think that's great. I think that's important. I'm not in any way wanting to go back to a state of nature. But if you think about the way we conceptualize human flourishing now, there are lots more people now who are talking about human flourishing in the same way you are than there were 20 years ago. A lot more. There are a lot more people who are saying that reason is all very well and good and it has uh, contributed a great deal, but something has gotten lost over the, the period since the Renaissance. That has been done, I think, um, brilliantly with regard to the arts by uh, Jacques Parzin in From Dawn to Decadence. I think a sociologist nobody has heard of anymore called Paterum Sorokin did a very a brilliant job of this in the arts when he had the notion of an ideational component and a sensate component to art, mm -hmm. and he takes that through history and comes up with a very similar uh, paradigm that, that you have. In, in Human Accomplishment, a book I wrote a long time ago, uh, I had some, some other parallels. And it goes to, I think, an understanding of a loss, first, of the sense of the transcendent, uh, second, to a sense of the 
the, the non-material aspects of life and their importance to human flourishing, and to the excesses that have been produced, perhaps inevitably, uh, by the technological progress that we have experienced. I really recommend you, you get the book, because whereas there were only maybe five minutes devoted to his, his historical analysis, uh, Ian has chapters on antiquity, on the Renaissance, on the Industrial Revolution, on Romanticism, postmodernism, which I think brilliantly capture this slowly changing and developing and welcome uh, uh, trend toward a sense of what was lost. And in fact, I'm inclined, I'll be interested in George Will's take on this if we have a chance later today, that instead of a left-right divide now, we sort of have a divide between those people who are okay with the left brain way of looking at the world from the left or the right, and those on the left or the right who are saying what has been lost over the last couple of hundred years. So I congratulate you. I'm not going, we have plenty of things for you guys to talk about without me adding questions right now, but I congratulate you on the book. I don't think it's going to be forgotten in 30 years, no matter what happens with the left brain, right bang thing. I think, you're, I think you are a hold of some deep truths uh, that need to be come to grips with. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so we'd like to give John a chance to either respond to anything that Charles said or talk a little bit about your relationship with Ian and how this has influenced your work. Well, I <clears throat> think I mentioned that I was very left brain. <clears throat> we use that, knowing that it's uh, in its earlier use it was discredited. Um, I remember as a boy looking at poetry and thinking, why don't they just say what they mean? <laughs> you see what I mean? Why don't they just say it? And I think that I was tremendously... In my education, there was nothing really apart from the two painting sessions <laughs> every week. Apart from that, there was nothing to develop. I mean, nobody ever told me anything about creativity. And that's extraordinary. Can you believe you can have a good English education from the age of eight to leaving Cambridge and no one ever tells you how to think more creatively? It's just extraordinary. And what I think is fascinating is, in education, it occurs to me, you know, Jung could never see the point of algebra. You know, and Winston Churchill got into trouble because um, he didn't see why men saw a table should have a vocative case. You see what I mean? <laughs> right? I mean, he said to the teacher, well, we don't address tables in our family. Do you see what I mean? <laughs> so <clears throat> an enormous amount of stuff is just given to us without any real explanation. And we learn it more or less by rote, and we think that this is an education. And in my case, it wasn't until I got to Cambridge that I discovered I had any uh, creative ability at all. No, no teacher had ever said, oh, you, you know. I wrote an essay when I was about 16. It was a essay on time. And I still remember that I wrote the whole essay about the fact that I didn't have time to write the essay, <laughs> which is quite neat. But not a single teacher ever said to me, and I used it twice with different people. <laughs> <laughs> you always need to reuse your material. Yeah, really. Oh, of course. Uh, I, I, nobody ever said to me, you know, be creative. So what I discovered was that um, the, the mo there were two or three really important mo moments in my life. One was watching a documentary on the BBC when I was about 15 or 16, and a, a psychiatrist um, hypnotized someone and said, I want you to go out of the room, and then when you come back in, will you please go over to that vase of flowers and, and pour water uh, the water on the carpet. And the guy did that. He came over, he walked over to the flowers, pulled them up, pulled them up. And then the psychiatrist said, that's interesting what you do. Why did you do that? 
And you saw at that moment that the guy had no idea why he'd done it, but he immediately started to rationalize. And he says something like, I, I thought I saw a, um, a, a, a cigarette butt and a little bit of smoke, so I thought I'd better, you see what I mean? And I suddenly thought, what is going on here? Then at Cambridge, I found that if I was trying to write something in the evening, provided I put the work in on it, but if I put the work in on it, but I could sit down in the morning with a cup of coffee and look at what I'd been writing with Graham Chapman the previous night, and the ending would be perfectly clear. I couldn't even remember what the problem had been. Then I lost a script and I knew Gray would be angry with me, so I reconstructed it from memory and then I found an original, the original that I'd lost, and the one I'd done from memory was quite noticeably better. Yet I wasn't trying to make it better, so my brain must have been working on it even after I'd finished writing it. So once you start seeing the extraordinary things that can go on in here, then my favorite uh, experiment was when they got some, I talked about this at lunch, they projected some Chinese characters or ideograms or pictograms, what do you call them, on the screen, said to the people, will you look at these, had them a few days later, said, we're going to show you some new ones, some old ones, will you please tell us the ones you saw last week? The results were absolutely hopeless, of course, chance. Then they repeated the experiment. Instead of the second stage saying, what did you see last week? The, the fellow said, just look at the pictures, and if you like some a little bit more than others, you just think it's a pleasant shape, or there's something about it you like. And then all the ones that they liked were the ones they'd seen the previous week. Now that shows the brain's got the most extraordinary capabilities for absorbing information um, but it's very hard to get messages from the unconscious because they don't come out as nice, neat little bits of Brain. Type data. Do you yeah. see what I mean? They yeah. come out like we were saying at lunchtime, what is it, Kakuli von Stavnitz, looking into the fire, yeah. all right? And the, the, he's very tired and sleepy and he's just looking at the fire and he sees these flames like this and then suddenly he starts thinking that there's, there's snakes biting each other's tails, and suddenly he thinks, oh my God, it's a carbon ring. You know, out of the blue after 20 years of studying it. So, you know, one of the things, how, how do we contact this? And when I teach creativity, which I think is the one thing I kind of understand, the answer is to let the mind go much quieter. And... Um, have boundaries of space so people aren't interrupt I'm interrupting you because I think interrupting is the death of, of creativity interruption and and um, uh, boundaries of time because the, the great research on it I think was done by a guy called McKinsey um, Berkeley do we think McKinnon, McKinnon I'm sorry McKinnon um, and he, he particularly studied architects he studied professionals and came to the conclusion that there were only two things that made them creative. One was um, their ability to play. And that's why some extraordinarily intellectual and brilliant people aren't creative, because they don't know how to let go and, 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 and play. And, uh, and the other thing is that, the, which is interesting, you know, for, in a business environment, that they delay making a decision until the last possible moment. And when I used to make management training films, it was the most interesting thing I ever learned was that the first thing you do when you have to make a decision is to say, when do I have to make it? And then don't make it till then. Why would you make it till then? You might get new information. You might get new ideas if you know how to cultivate them. So it's as though that we've got this extraordinary part of our mind that is not conscious um, but that gives us a feeling of, of <coughs> meaning in life that you don't really get from doing the kind of verbal philosophy they were doing in Oxford when you were there. So that was just sort of vague. Very good, but, thank you. But a lot of what I'm saying is just based on intuition and knowing that if I go into a creative space, I should have mentioned this, 
And I find myself after 20 minutes, the, the mind quietens itself a little bit and you start really focusing on the problem. But you're not striving. Mm. You know, you're not striving, that's the point. Mm. Um, and, and, uh, and stuff comes and I find that state of mind, I'm probably happier than I am anything else because my, my, my perception of the world seems to be quite broad. Whereas when I have to go into a sort of closed mode, and I don't know to what extent that mm -hmm. coincides with your slicing of what you're doing. When I go into a closed mode, uh, <clears throat> I get tunnel vision, and then I, uh, I, I, I don't, I become completely unaware of where I am and who I am. And, you know, I'm just focused on that, and I'm much happier when my vision is wide. So what strikes me about that is how, how much we prize that state of being extremely narrowly yeah, focused, exactly. you know, and and you know, this is particularly true in Washington, I think, uh, you know, where the ability to um, read, analyze, digest, and then spit it back out is practically the coin of the realm mm. um, in terms of. You see, uh, we worship this, clarity, don't yeah. we? We do, and there's nothing wrong with clarity but it's dangerous to be clearer than the, <laughs> the experience permits. I always say one should strive to be as clear and precise as the situation warrants, but not a whit more. more yeah. I think that's terribly important. Do you know the word precise comes from the Latin word meaning cut off before its time? Yeah. pre quesos too early. And it's different from being accurate. Accurate comes from a root that means to care and it takes more care. And can I give you a little example? One of the um, curators at the Natural History Museum in London, this amazing sort of Victorian Gothic thing, has a great hall with dinosaur skeletons in it. And he was passing through and he overheard one of the <clears throat> attendants telling an awed party of tourists that this dinosaur skeleton was nine million and six years old. <laughs> and, and, he, and he said to the... Uh, uh, attendant afterwards, how do you know it's nine million and six years old? And he said, well, it was nine million years old when I started working. <laughs> <laughs> and that was six years ago. <laughs> so that is, that is more precise, but much less accurate. Uh -huh. There's a distinct... <laughs> <laughs> have, have you ever uh, uh, put your work together with Csikszentmihalyi's uh, 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 concept of flow? Well, yes, I, I think flow is terribly important. And in fact, it's the subject of the book that I've nearly finished writing, which is even longer than The Master and His Energy. <laughs> um, because I think, I can't tell you how central I think this idea of flow is. Uh, I, actually, I think most philosophical insights are already in Heraclitus, who famously said, everything flows. And I haven't got time now to unpack why that is absolutely essential, but it is, in my view. Um, and I'm rather disappointed with Csikszentmihalyi um, because he uses it largely to mean a so-called flow state, which is supposed to be more creative, but it doesn't really get you any further because he's not relating it to anything very much. So <clears throat> although, although it's a it's useful concept, um, I wouldn't sort of really draw on him very much. Just very, very quickly, that was the kind of thing that John was talking about. Uh, when you're in the zone, when, when you are unaware of what you are doing, mm. you're just totally into it that things uh, will happen. Mm. In my case, the, the, par the, the comparable thing to the kinds of examples you were getting is that sometimes, doesn't happen very often, but sometimes my fingers will type a sentence and I'll I sit back and say, where the hell did that come from? Yeah. And because it, it, it has well, a novelist. Well, Th Thackeray, yeah. 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 Thackeray said, Sometimes I don't know what it is that gets into me. It feels like something has taken over my hand. Yeah, yeah. And, and one of my characters says something, and I go, where the dickens did he get that from? <laughs> yeah. So uh, this isn't exactly right, left, but it is pretty much in that, I mean, the right hemisphere is not unconscious, but the right hemisphere knows a hell of a lot of things that it can't speak because speech is in the left hemisphere. Uh, Lawrence Olivier used to start to create his parts by concentrating on how the character walked. Very good. You know? 
embodied. But, because you, the whole you thing is, it's, it. it's a gestalt. Yes, exactly. And once you've got how he walks and you've got how he gestures, but you also begin to get how he speaks. And I think that's what novelists do, and they create characters. Uh, I know that as an actor sometimes, you, you, you don't really know how to play it. I did Shakespeare once with a wonderful experience, Taming the Shrew, and I kept um, thinking, well, how do I make this work? And then in, just by repeating it many times, I just suddenly feel something that felt right. And it was entirely instinctive. It wasn't really intellectual. It was just a feeling, that's right. And as you go on playing the character, you get more moments when you think, oh, that's right, and more moments when you think, oh, that wouldn't be right. Do you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I think that's what novelists are doing when they're creating characters. And sometimes these characters, the novelists, as you say, they just take over. Mm. A subsidiary ca character becomes the main character in the novel. But the thing about uh, one of the expo uh, experiments with Csikszentmihalyi in Chicago was with the Art Institute there. Do you know about this one? It's very, it says a lot. They had a lot of people that were studying art and they decided to get them to draw still life. So they put a big table up there with lots of objects on it and each student <coughs> Excuse me. Had a had a uh, had a desk, and the students they they began to realize they they uh, they worked in 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 kind of two different ways. You know, the behavior seemed to fall into two groups. <coughs> I'm so sorry. Hmm. One group would go up and choose the objects quite quickly, come back, rearrange them a little bit, rearrange them again, and start drawing. The other ones would go up to the objects and would look at them, but they'd also handle them. Mm -hmm. And they'd even kind of sort of toss them in the air and feel them and all this, mm -hmm. do that, they kind of mm -hmm. experience the objects. And they'd go back to the desk and try this and try that. <coughs> <laughs> then this second group would go back up and change the object and put another object in. So they took much, much longer to choose the object and much, much longer to um, choose the, the uh, structure of the, of the drawing. And when, uh, when professional artists judged it afterwards, it was all the ones who'd taken the time who did what the professional artists thought were really good paintings. And some years later, when they checked on these people, these were the ones who had actually made a successful living in, in that world of design and, and, and drawing. But you see, they were, it were, they were just calling on all their fac uh, faculties. Right. Ta all that tacit knowledge that is mm. there, but... It's, there's huge yeah. knowledge there. Yeah. But we have to be careful because that's not the only thing we can go on. It doesn't matter so much if we're drawing, yeah. do you see what I mean? Yeah. But there's some point where the more critical brain has got to come in and assess it, but then it has to be reintegrated, right? Well, the whole point is we need both. Um, and my point is simply that at the moment, we're very unbalanced. We rely on too much on one faculty alone. Mm -hmm. And nothing works well if you don't combine. I, I, in the book I'm writing, I'm suggesting, amongst other things, that there are four main powers that most of us would agree are, are the ways in which we discover any kind of a truth. One is science, one is reason, another is intuition, and another is imagination. And that each of them has its pitfalls. And that each of them is contributed to by the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere. But that the problem is if you don't allow the right hemisphere aspect, you impoverish hugely what you're doing. So we need all four of those. If any attempt to arrive at a, at a truth about something doesn't incorporate science, reason, intuition, and imagination, then it is not going to be a, a successful attempt. Um, and nowadays, intuition has got quite a bad rap for, for good reasons, because it can be fallible. Um, but uh, since Daniel Kahneman, uh, ingenious experiments that show how sometimes we are mistaken about these things, um, this, this is very valuable, very funny, and I've often lectured on it. But I often think also there are some incredibly interesting and entirely baffling uh, optical illusions. 
And they're so powerful that you are quite convinced that a, a square that is actually white is, is, is a gray one on a checkerboard because of a shadow. And that is very powerful. But I've never heard anyone say, well, that does it. I'm giving up on vision altogether. Uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, the, there are optical illusions and there are intuitive illusions. But, but it would be a huge mistake to cast aside our intuitive faculties. And interestingly, going back to something you were saying earlier, scientists, mathematicians, when you come to look at the stories about how they made their great discoveries, hardly a single one was made by following a routine method. They practically all were made by doing a lot of hard work, amassing a lot of information, thinking and thinking and thinking, and then letting the mind alone. And out of this came an analogy, an image, a metaphor, which in fact concealed the truth. Well, that's a great note for us to end on, actually. Thank you. Okay. And thank, let's thank our guests again for coming. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. That's the end of our program. We appreciate your attention and your interest in this topic.